So today we are having a joint grand rounds with Chip Foley and myself. I don't feel like I need to say anything about myself. You guys are pretty familiar with me, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But I am delighted to introduce Chip Foley, and um, had, I have had the chance to review his CV. <laughs> <laughs> so he went to Williams College, and then he went to Harvard Medical School, where I met him. He was a medical student. I was an intern. I used my position of power and authority to win his love. It's true. <laughs> now, actually, we didn't start dating until the rotation was over. I mean that. So. After medical school, he did his internship and residency at the New England Deaconess Hospital in Boston. And he also did a year of surgical endoscopy at the MGH and then did his fellowship in colorectal surgery at the Leahy Clinic. So then we moved to Virginia, and we could talk more about that. But in the context of his CV, of course, many papers, many clubs, many this, lots of grants, the whole thing. When I look at Chip's CV, what I see is a really impressive teaching record. He won every award twice at UVA for teaching. And since he's been here at the University of Wisconsin, similarly, he's won a lot of teaching awards. He's been residency director for general surgery for a number of years. And uh, like this month, he was appointed vice chair of um, education for the Department of Surgery. I aspire to be as patient of a teacher as he is. People who have operated with him know he's a very patient, wonderful teacher. Now the topic today, two surgeon couples, I want to say that, look, this is, this is, there's something in this talk for everybody. Because really, there's nothing special about two surgeon couples. It's all about how hard we work. Everybody in this room brings this so we're going to tell our own little story. But there's plenty in there for everybody. So Chip, come on up. Oh, great. Thank you. Yep. Cool. So it's uh, certainly a pleasure uh, for me to come and uh, to join your department this morning. It feels like my second family in the department uh, for a lot of obvious ways. About a year ago, uh, Laurel, I got an email, actually, uh, from uh, the surgeons at University of Virginia where said, as many of you know, we spent the first half of our career, 14 or 15 years, uh, and they invited us to come as a couple to give surgery grand rounds. And so I yelled out in the other room, hey, Laurel, UVA, they want us to come and give grand rounds. And, and, and she, I heard that she thought, hey, that's really great. And then I said, well, and they want us to talk about two surgery career families. And there was dead silence. <laughs> um, because it's not something that, that was in our repertoire as such as you know, it's not something that we actually spent a lot of time thinking about, certainly not a lot, or something that we had put together a talk or really thought a lot about. Um, didn't, in many ways, think of ourselves as experts in the field, other than the obvious demographic uh, situation that we were in. But it set us, unlike most grand rounds, you know, if you wanted me to talk to you about complex pelvic surgery or colon cancer, you know, I got tons of stuff like that hear about ovarian cancer. This was something that actually I think both of us were really challenged by about how we'd respond to that request. Uh, and so about a month ago we went. Um, as th those of you who know both of us, uh, our responses to that challenge were probably completely different. Uh, and so we came up with this joint grand rounds that we gave in Virginia last month. Uh, and it has got a couple of parts. It's a little bit of a potpourri. It's a little bit of a back and forth. And so uh, what we're going to do is uh, Laurel gives some talk, a little bit of talk about some things that are in the literature. I'm actually going to show you a movie uh, that I made. Uh, and then Laurel's going to talk about um, some more personal comments about how this is applied and the challenges that we faced as, a, as uh, individual people. Um, I do think, as Laurel said, that is a topic that is completely applicable, probably not only to, certainly not just to two surgery career families, but certainly to two career medical families. And I, and I suspect, in fact, is true for, for two professional families. A lot of the same themes come out that I think are applicable to couples who are trying to both have careers, uh, but also to the other things in their lives that they find super fascinating. All right, so to get going, Laurel's going to going to tell you a little bit about what's in the literature.
as usual, uh, Chip is remarkably generous because actually what I, there was not a pregnant pause. There was a hell no. <laughs> hell no. I said to him, we are not doing that. There, there's no way we're getting up in public and talking about this with people that were there when all that was really more mentioned than it is now. And then he said, well, look who's asking us. It was the chair of surgery and the ex-chair of surgery. Both of them have been remarkably generous to us. So I acquiesced. And as Chip said, this was a difficult talk to pull together. So you can see we've got some learning objectives here, historical context, some issues, what, how to think about it moving forward. Now my first thought when this email came was like, why in God's name would they invite us? We are the opposite of the gold standard. That was my opinion and I still kind of think, I don't know. But then I thought, okay, well, we're still married. We have our 30th wedding anniversary this month. The kids, yo, truth. And in terms of the kids, there's no felonies or unplanned pregnancies. Woo! And <laughs> nice. And you know what? I still really like my job and so does Chip. So I thought, well, fair enough. So here's just a little data. I'm going to give you some data points with a little personal interpretation. So 54% of married or partnered couples today have both partners in the workplace. Again, so we're not special. Um, surgeons today, if you look at men, 50% have a working domestic partner. <coughs> and for women, it's higher. That makes sense. And this is just a graph looking at the workforce from 1950 to 2050. It's changed a lot. And again, everybody knows this. And it's probable that it'll kind of hang at that rate for the next upteen number of decades. So I called Joe Beiste, who's head of the, she's the Associate Director of the American Board of Surgery, housed in Philadelphia. This was before we went, because I couldn't find the perfect numbers for this. 64,000 fellows in the American College of Surgeons. And if you add the fellows, you know, the youngsters, students, residents, and fellows, the number of women goes from 8.5% to 14%. So women in surgery, it's an increasing demographic, as it is certainly for our field, to say the least. So there's a lot of, I, you know, I did a literature search, the PubMed, and there's really only one decent article about this. And it's physicians married or partnered to physicians, a comparative study. And the senior author on this paper was chair at Hopkins for a number of years, Julie Feiston. How do you say her name? Feiston, I think, is her name. So I'm going to walk through this paper and do a little bit of interpretation of the data for you. It's a survey. 8,000 responding surgeons with a response rate of about 32%, not bad. 86% were men, 13% were women. So more women responded to men in terms of the survey. So the domestic partner, 90% of the folks that responded to this survey had a domestic partner. 48% of the partners did not work out of the, did not work out of the home. 51% did work outside the home, and of that 51%, a third were physicians. So a third of the surgeons married to people that worked were married to doctors, and a third of that group are surgeons. So you're, we're talking about 335 couples here. And then 68% of the domestic partners were working non-physicians. You'll see where I'm going. That's a lot of words, but you'll see where I'm going with this. So the primary outcome in this outcomes in this paper, burnout, positive depression screen, mental and physical quality of life. So this is a quality of life paper, and it, it's very well done. The statistics are right on, and again, the response rate was 32%, best paper available in the literature. I think the interesting part of this, though, is not actually the primary outcome. It's some of the demographics. The weakness is, you know, it's only a 32 percent response rate, it's cross-sectional, you can't talk about causality, and it doesn't take into consideration a lot of things that we know are really important. A disabled child, there's a whole number of things that they just couldn't account for here. Large sample size and great statistical analysis. 
So the first, and again, I'm going to the demographic, not the primary outcome. The divorce rate through this 8,000 surgeons. If the domestic partner stayed at home, it was 15%. Working physician, about the same. Working non-physician, higher. Statistically significant. That makes sense to me. I think it would be hard to be married to us, meaning all of us, not just me. We all know it'd be hard to be married to me. But I think that's, I think it's easy to underestimate how hard it is to understand this thing of you gotta go to the hospital. So that actually does not surprise me at all. In terms of children and career, the question was commitment to raising children slowed their career. If the domestic partner was at home, still slowed the career, 19%. Working physician, 39%. Surgeon, surgeon, the highest. Now, I have to just say here, why this is not 100% for everybody is nonsense. If you're saying that you're, you know, that those two are not related, like I got a comment about that, I'm going to hold back. But it should, in my opinion, it should be 100% for everybody. There you go. And so what about work-home conflicts? I mean, like, oh, I should be home, oh, I should be at work. So if the domestic partner was at home, it's still 49%. There's no chip shots here. I mean, that means if you have a partner that's staying at home, it doesn't mean it's a home run. Working physician, 62%. Surgeon, surgeon, 69%. So, you know, for people married to surgeons, they're saying, gee, there's more conflict regarding home and work. Domestic partner, working, non-physician, still quite high, 48%. Career conflicts, like, ooh, I'd like to write that paper, I don't have time because I need to go home, et cetera. There's a million things like that. If, you're, if the domestic partner was a working physician, 49%, no different for surgeons, non-surgeons, and was working non-physicians, 40%. So I, I don't think that's really strikes me as odd. So the summary statement is the divorce rate's higher if you're married to working non-physicians. Highest degree of career slowdown by child rearing, two surgeon units. Highest degree of work home conflicts, two surgeon units. Highest degree of career conflicts, two physician units. And you know, I think, I, you know, I think this data is what it is. And it, I don't find it shocking, but somehow it's, I don't know if I call it validating, but it, it's something. And then the other take home message is what I've said a couple times here. It, you know, surgeon, surgeon, nothing special about that in the context of the whole, whole landscape. In terms of the primary outcomes, the evaluation for burnout, et cetera, was very well done. And it was just statistically the same for all three groups. However, high emotional exhaustion was more prevalent among surgeons with working non-physicians. And I think, I think that goes to the complexity of people understanding what we do. And then the depressive symptoms, uh, no difference between surgeons partner with physicians or working non-physicians, but surgeons partner with stay-at-home domestic partners were slightly less depressed. So it's a little bit all over the map here. Quality of life, more surgeons in dual physician relationships were below the, the population norm. In terms of career satisfaction, like would you become a physician again, would you become a surgeon again? There was no difference in career satisfaction by domestic partner's employment status. However, surgeons whose domestic partners stayed home were more satisfied with their careers. So there's a lot in this paper. It was published in 2008. And again, I'm more interested in the demographic as it relates to the first part of what I talked about rather than the second. So I'm going to turn it over to Chip. So as I said, I'm not sure that Laurel and I, either one of us, really, when we got this invitation, thought that we were experts in career families. Um, but that's interesting. As, we th as I thought back, um, it is true that we were in Virginia we were actually asked to comment about it in different groups and resident particular trainees and things. Um, and, and as I think back on that time, 
we were in fact in the unique set of circumstances where we were the only couple that fit that demographic at the beginning of the time. And as I started to think about this, um, one of the things be that became obvious to me as I thought about our own department is that there are presently eight couples uh, in the Department of Surgery, um, which is really kind of an amazing thing. I think it's a testimony to the, the kind of place that Wisconsin is. Uh, and perhaps probably to avoid getting up here and talking about our own personal lives for the entire time, I thought it might be interesting to go to that group of 16 people and ask them some questions about what it's like to be a true career surgery family. And I probably, I mean, and, and I didn't know what the response would be, you know, I, I didn't know if anybody would want to talk about it, whether they'd say anything about it. And I actually couldn't get them to stop talking about it in the past. I probably have four or five hours of video that I have distilled down in conversations that, they, that I've had with that group of people. Uh, and so I got about 20 minute video that I want to show you. Uh, it, it'd be interesting, I think, maybe even more interesting for you guys because you, you know most of them, if not all of them. Uh, it's a diverse group. Um, there is a broad demographic, so we have senior faculty, we have uh, senior trainees, uh, we have uh, couples that work together in the workplace and those that just work in the department. We, um, they, they actually represent almost all the sections in our department. Uh, there is a, if, if you know the people that are involved, there is actually parents and a child. Uh, so, <laughs> so what I want to do is Mouse underneath here to see if I can make this. Where's the first one? No, I got it. I think I got it. Let's see if it'll come up. And this was just me on my iPhone.
<laughs> so I, I, you know, there's, there's tons and tons of stuff in there. You know, there's, there's, you know, dozens of, I think, important topics that have obviously been important to this group of people. Uh, I wanted to, to publicly thank, uh, here's a, a listing of the people that I actually talked to about this. And, and, uh, and uh, again, I was amazed at how much I got out of them <coughs> and how much a lot of the stuff that they said really resonated with my own personal experience of going through some of the stuff that they've gone through as well. All right, so to finish up, Laurel's going to say a few more personal things, I guess. So I think under every circumstance and connection, it's just a lot. Work, home life, it's all about work-life balance. And, and harkening back to what I said when we started this talk of like, why are we the gold standard? But whatever, we'll keep making them. So, you know, I don't think we're unique. Lots of people work hard, many hours, stressful jobs. Sev Wu was one of my attendings when I was an intern. And she was one of Chip's attendants, and now she's one of Olivia's attendants. So it's a nice little circle of life. And she said to me one day, it was, you know, because this was before duty hours, let me tell you. And she, you know, I don't know, we were, she, you know, she's still a wonderful friend of mine. She said, Laurel, there are many women working in factories trying to support their families. We have it pretty good. And <coughs> I kind of did. But she was a point. So if the goal is to be happy at work, to be happy at home and contribute to society. There's so many lists of the pros and cons of regarding two position families. And there is a plethora of like suggestions. Oh my God, Google this. It's like, okay, this, you know, it's like the how to of everything, which I have always kind of steered away from because I find it annoying, but I did kind of look it over. So what I kind of think about here is compartmentalization. What can I control and what can I not control? And it varies over a career. You cannot control social mores. This thing about when the guys take the kids to work, they're gods. When the women take the kids to work, they're losers. That is alive and well. And it maybe it's become more subtle, but that just pisses me off beyond belief. Now, you know, same-sex couples have their own issues. And then, you know, you don't control from whence you came. I won the lottery. I have great parents. My dad and dad are not alive. Both worked crazy, six kids, no money. And I just won the lottery. You don't control where you come from. Um, X amount of emotional energy. It is finite. You have, and it changes over a lifetime where you can put your priorities. Family, patients, the faculty I work for, women in general, reproductive rights, maternal mortality, infant mortality, all the things that we talk about a lot in this department. You have to size up how much you have to give at any one particular moment. So this article was published a few years ago in the Atlantic Monthly, Why Women Still Can't Have It All, the greatest number of hits in this journal, magazine, ever. Anne-Marie Slaughter wrote this article. And, you know, I, I forced myself to read it. When it first came out, I was like, oh, I'm not reading that, for God's sake. But I read it, and she's followed up with a book, Unfinished Business. And there, there are some good points in this book. There's one chapter that talks about, and I think this would have helped Chip and I, if we, the only thing we talked about before we got married and had kids was like, yeah, we need, we're going to need a nanny here. That's, that's the only thing we talked about. And in fact, it was more complex than that. <laughs> but she, the book is probably worth reading, and also everybody knows Cheryl Sandberg lean in. She just wrote a book about grief. Um, I, my question here is why aren't there more books for men? I think Chip faces just as many weird things as I do, different, but, I mean, the, you know, it's not just one direction. Um, and there's plenty of examples, like, okay, why would a man move somewhere because his wife got a job as a chair? Why would that happen? People have asked him that. <coughs> That's, like, ridiculous. Um, you know, 
And then there's other things like the fact that in this country, women physicians make less money than male physicians. The data is good. This paper just came out at Gamma, 24 states equal. 8% difference based on rank, RVUs, age. They have it all right. Specialty. So there, there's plenty of things to deal with on a gender, from a gender-based issue. And you know, there's a lot of things you can't control. Work environments, you can't find the right mentor, sponsor, you work with a bunch of jackasses. That's happened to me before. Children with special needs, illnesses in the family, life is complicated. So you have to be nimble, nimble and quick and size it up. <laughs> it's funny, what Josh said made me laugh. I don't know how many times he just said, Laurel, if you could pay somebody to wipe your behind, <laughs> who would do it? And my answer was, yes, I would. So it's time or money in many ways. You've heard this a million which ways. And you know, I subscribe to the same thing. Chip and I had the same nanny for 14 years. She'd come on Sunday night, she would leave on Friday night. She lived with us. And we're still devoted to her. There were three parents in our household. Um, but you know, remember something about this money thing. That means, you know, you're gonna have less in your retirement. You have to both be on the same page that this is where you're gonna spend some cash and not live just in the moment. I'm a really big believer in interval training, meaning there's times you put your foot on the pedal, there's times you take your foot off. I look back at the last 30 years, and you know I think that's one thing that you know both of us have done right in our own ways. There's times you say, okay, I'm gonna write those papers, or I'm gonna see those extra 10 patients per week, and times you say, okay, I am so dialing this back because I really need to do that. And that's okay. The only caveat in the, our field is, you know, you can't really leave the operating room for a couple of years. And you could do that whole reentry thing, but I think it's very difficult. And that interval training applies to research, teaching, advocacy. When I was at UVA, I did no advocacy. I said, okay, I can't do it. I cannot deal with this. And God knows that's taking me to advocacy. But I just, you, you got to size it up, how much you got to give. So things to think about. I think we could have used an Excel spreadsheet when we got married and had kids. You know, money, raising children, shared responsibilities. It, that would have actually helped. And Anne Marie Slaughter writes about that. Having those conversations before you really have the kids. The marriage part's not complicated. When you introduce kids into the formula, it gets really complicated. Capitalize on individual strengths. Like, I'm a pretty effective multitasker. If I had been in charge of math homework at home, neither kid would have gone to college. There is no <laughs> doubt about it. I remember when I first tried to help with the math and I backed slowly out of the room. <laughs> Both kids were like, get my father in here. So, you know, you got to figure out what you can do well and what you can't do well. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot to say here about child care. Um, I like what Anne Lador said, well, we have three nannies. You know, there, that's one way to do it. But, you know, I, I really, Chip and I both love the fact that our nanny lived with us. She was with us for 14 years, and the kids had a lot of respect for her. Whenever there was a conflict, we always backed her, not the children. And that went a long way. And then, if you, you know, being a parental unit, just showing that face to the kids is good. And then save something for yourself. I think this is really important. Even if it's something as stupid as the care master in the morning for a half an hour. No one can call me. No one's up at four for the most part. Now, there, I have been called out of the stairmaster, master, but that's rare. But having that one thing, it's just like nobody's talking to me. I'm doing whatever I want. And then have a lot together as much as you can. There's not much time. There, when the kids got older, Chip and I started road biking. We really just didn't share that. We loved doing it together. We'd be family counselors on several occasions. If you look over the lifespan of this whole operation of career, family, et cetera, you know, you gotta tap into as many resources as you can. And then make sure you have wonderful partners at work. I have wonderful partners. Thank you. And because you can't worry about your patients when you're home. Or in this case, doing chair stuff. 
just it's just not possible. And I'm sure it's true for everybody in the room. It makes you crazy if you're not at work and your patients are being cared for. I have wonderful partners. I'm grateful. Always be nimble. Plan A doesn't work. Go to Plan B. And that's all we have. So we'd love to take some questions. Please come on up. Thank you. Any comments or questions from anyone? Yeah, these Your people. Thoughts. Yeah. So I'm on the I'm a vis I'm on the away court here. So let me uh, let me comment about that first. I think um, my immediate response. I mean, it's different, right? I mean, so there is something different about it when I relate to you guys. It had not been for it may not be just the chair, although that gets unique. There's a unique part of that. I think it's also true for having a spouse that works in another department in any capacity that that's part of your relationship. So I, so I would say that my relationships with members of this department are admittedly probably different than they would be if Laura was not the chair. Um, but I also think, if you think about your professional relationships, you know, they're, they're, it's all like any relationships, right? You develop relationships and there's different aspects of it, and, and this is one aspect of my relationship with members of this department. But that's just one facet of all that. And I think in general, if I think about the summary of all that for me in terms of how we relate to members of this department, I think it actually is more beneficial than it is harmful. I mean, I've gotten to know you guys a lot better than I would if it not been for the fact that Laurel is the chair of this department. Um, and that's certainly true for your specialty. Uh, I think we overlap clinically or just, you know, go through the different things. And, and I do things. So I, I think it does affect it, but I think in aggregate, my immediate response is that there's a lot of positive parts of that difference. Uh, yeah, no, I agree with that. It's a little complicated. It helps that we have different last names, meaning, like, it took a lot of people a long time at UVA to figure out we were even married, which is even better for me. Yeah? <laughs> and there's a lot of funny stories about that, but I am holding back. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it's, 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 it's been, it's made, it's made it richer. It's gotten to know people in the general surgery department better. You know, we don't, you know, sadly, we don't get to each other's events, work things very often because it's double duty. Like, a lot of people in Jewish and Calvin just think that I'm making up the fact that I'm married. Like, nah, she's making that up. Oh, she's real legitimate, but whatever. So, um, but I think in general it's good. I, think I do think that that's that is a negative. You know, we try. You know, Laurel travels more than I do, but we both travel a fair bit, and we miss out because of just the career career thing. It makes it really difficult for us to share that part of our lives together in a way that many other spouses. You know, so we go to meetings, and people's spouses are there, and and, and we rarely can do that because we can't be away that much. I do think that's a negative. Absolutely. Like, if you've noticed at our graduations every year, honestly, I mean, Chip doesn't come because he's got four graduations to go to himself. And when I first started 10 years ago, I thought, well, that looks a little weird. She's showing up by herself. And now I'm, like, totally comfortable with it. I mean, like, part of it is social moray here. And then, you know, issues get raised, like, why is her husband not there and stuff like that. But in the end, you got to be a little Machiavellian about this in terms of success. Like, okay, he's not coming to that. That's not going to happen. He's got other stuff to do. And, yeah, and, and that's just one example of the concessions you have to make to be sensitive to the other person. He, and then there's, and then you have to also, Heidi, I think, identify the moments when actually you do have to be there. 
and there are those moments too, right? And, and so you have to be willing to be flexible and understand that, yes, it's true for 80% of the things that that's not valuable, but there's going to be a 20% and, and to be smart enough to figure out which ones those are. Gary. Yeah, you know, I think that that's a really important question, and in, in, in our society still, a lot of that is gender-based. So this is where I'm going right now. It's like you fed me that question, Mary. About a month ago, Bob Flannery said to me, he's the CEO of the foundation, he's wondering about, well, Laurel, what do you think about salary equity as a strategy for men and women? I said, well, Bob, here's this paper. Take a look at it. You know, why would we be different? And so, like, right now, I've got the, because you've got to look for opportunity to make major changes. Like, you're talking about a major change. And it will not happen in my lifetime, probably not in anybody's lifetime in this room. But I believe in incremental change. So I'm going to be on that committee. And every time I'm, this issue of salary equity comes up, I talk about maternity leave. And maternity, paternity, but let's, everybody in this room, it's a little different, like having the baby versus watching having the baby born. That's a little bit different. So just a physiologic thing. So I think, I think. <laughs> so I wasn't I, that important then? <laughs> oh. so, so I was cheering. And, I mean, yeah, now you are. <laughs> Go get them, Laurel. Um, but you know, I believe when opportunity knocks, you got to answer. And I think this thing you're talking about in terms of the workforce is really important. And I think I'm going to have some opportunity at UW. And then, you know, when I give national talks, I talk about this. Not that it matters, but whatever. But I do think my opportunity here at UW in the next year or two is, and, and I wouldn't have been prepared for that comment if I hadn't, like, been thinking about it. So part of this is studying it and thinking about it not having an emotional response, which is really difficult, and coming up with a plan where you really think you could make a difference. And I think the chair thing offers something, but everybody in this room has an opportunity to make a difference in one way or another with this, just by talking about it. Let me, let me take, just respond in a completely different area, um, which is I think that if our goal, which I think it probably is, is that we want to be able to provide professional and per personal opportunity for two career families. Um, you know, how do we do that? And in fact, how do we, how do we um, provide opportunity for professional and personal fulfillment in any way, right? And so I think a big part of it is mentorship. And so I think what, what we can do potentially as leaders of a residency or a department or something like that is to continue to do things and make decisions that allows us to provide positive mentorship for lifetime people. And, and I think about just, and I, and I alluded to this before, I mean the difference in the community between UVA and here, and some of that is generational because I mean, this is changing very fast. Some of it is cultural in terms of the organizations themselves, but on this particular topic, the, the opportunity that we have in the mentorship that you saw in this film to provide young people with a, an understanding and a pathway to be successful as two career families, I think, is tremendous. And so 
I work in a division of general surgery with 45 faculty, half are women, actually more than half. I mean, you think about the Department of Surgery a generation or two ago, and many today, I mean, that's unheard of, right? And almost all of those women are in key professional programs, or, you know, the vast majority of them probably are. So I think we have the, op so I think our ability to influence that and the faculty that we have and the support that we give young couples to achieve career families in our department collectively, I think, is also the way in which we then support the next generation of people to be successful in that front. Well, it's, it's interesting, if you look at just anecdotally of the two, the mid-career and the senior career people in our video, women, both of whom talked about that, both of them expressed a sense that early in their careers they were not as productive as their male car counterparts because of the increased burden of having small children. But there was also some hope in that, right, because both of them then said there was a time when they were able to, to grow, right? and so. I bet if you looked at it, you would be able to actually measure that objectively, because I think that that's probably not an unusual set of circumstances, particularly for women who are in traditional academic positions. Lisa. Makes me, wait, I gotta tell the story. So we had Olivia, <laughs> this is, this makes me think of this. This is why it's only an hour, because yeah, this, the no, further this goes, this go, the worse yeah. it gets. So hopefully we'll, <laughs> it's, probably it's good the hard stop here. She was sensitive to that. So we had Olivia in November. He finished his residency December 31st, so he had six months at home with Olivia while I was faculty and had five weeks and um, I can remember coming home from work, and there's all these like gifts in the house. I'm thinking, Chip, what the hell? He goes, oh, every day I go to the gym, and all the women they give me gifts because they think I'm so hot because I'm here with a booty. Uh, that just made me mad. It was 10 anyway. o'clock in the morning. I go to the gym, and it was me and six or seven other women and their babies. Yeah. And I was, but there was, but it was. It was our culture, right? Yeah. That, that was just such a unique so set of circumstances that it was so noticeable, right? I yeah. think so. Okay, I let think me let me say one more thing. So I think and it gets back to some of the things. I think that that to me, life is a series of um, of you know sacrifices and concessions and priorities and value things. At the end of the day, the the good thing is is there's probably more to do in life than has begun. And so I think. We all have to make judgments about what we value. Um, we probably all could be more productive at work if that's all we did, but yet we have other priorities. We probably, at the end of the day, would be more effective at home if that's all we did. Um, and so we have to strike a balance in that. That's, that is something that we as two career families, be, because of the tensions of your time, et cetera, we are forced to do that, but yet we have to understand that that's part of what our lives are. We make judgments all the time. And, and so 
I don't think it's a bad thing necessarily to make those concessions. You just have to have a pretty strong sense in yourself and then with your spouse about what your values are. At the end of the day, we both could have written more papers in our lives, right? Or we both could have, I don't know, done whatever, done more cases, whatever, right? Made more money. Um, but you have to be able to be guided by your basic core personal values in order to make those types of decisions. And I think that's an important part of the concession system. So. Yeah, I think we're time out. Thank you very much.